focusing on bar plots. Um, and then I'm going to talk about three ways that you can visualize your data that are better than R, that can sort of better show off the complete picture of your data set. First of all, I'm going to do a presentation talking about these things, but then I will switch over to an R markdown where I will show you the code for being able to make these three different types of plots in R, and I will go through those in detail. Um, I will take pauses at points, but you are, of course, welcome to at any point ask questions. You, you can either ask a question by unmuting yourself. You can also do the raise hand thing if you want. Marion will keep an eye on that. Um, you can write questions in the chat. The way I have this set up on my screen, you should be able to, um, no, sorry, I can see the chat, I think, but I may miss it. So if not, Marion, I think is also going to keep an eye on the chat. Um, yeah, so Marion did briefly say about me. Um, for those of you that maybe don't know me so well, I did my PhD at the University of Birmingham. I finished it last year and I actually did my viva in the first week of lockdown in the UK. So this is in March last year. And this is a picture that I really love and I just like to bring it out at all opportunities. But this is a picture of me actually in my viva that I did remotely. So you can see my examiners on screen, but why I really like this picture is because you can see my cat on my lap. And I don't think many people get to have their cats in their vibes, so I really like this picture. Um, as Ryan said, I'm now a postdoc at the University of Warwick. Broadly, my research is in language processing across the lifespan. What I'm going to be talking about today, data visualizations can apply to all sorts of different data and research. So it's not particularly relevant, but I thought it'd be interesting to know. Um, and I think I've learned a lot and I still am learning about data visualization from lots of different people. And a lot of these people are on Twitter. I really recommend Twitter as a really useful place to sort of learn all these different things about data visualization. Um, and hopefully I can sort of pass on some of these things to you today. Um, so just to sort of think about how we process data, this is really great. Uh, illustration here, thinking about the data conveyor belt. And when you get your data, either maybe you've done an experiment and you've got your data, or you know, you might work in industry and you get given your data, you tend to have to go through these three steps. Data wrangling, in which you get the data into an appropriate format, mm -hmm. followed by visualization, in which you make the data, well, sorry, in which you visualize your data and have a look at it, followed by modeling or statistical analyses. And these, all these three steps are really key. And what I'm going to be concentrating on today is the middle step, the visualization. And unfortunately, quite often people miss out this step. And they're very keen to analyze their data and they go straight from wrangling to modeling. But the visualization is such an important step because unless you properly visualize your data, it is a lot, lot harder to understand the output of the models or any of the statistical analyses that you do. Um, so that's what the whole focus of this talk and workshop is going to be on today. One thing I just want to point out is I'm going to be sharing a lot of really good resources in this talk. The OSF link that Marion shared, you can find a PDF copy of this uh, PowerPoint that I'm doing. And on every single slide, there is a hyperlink in the corner, such as this Alison Hall's R illustrations, which will take you to the original resource if you want to maybe see a bit more about the things that I talk about. Um, someone said, please share those that you follow on Twitter. Yes, I should do this. Maybe if you, I can maybe do a tweet about this later. I can't quite remember off the top of my head now, but I will uh, do that at some point. Um, but also there's lots of links here to useful things. Okay, so um, in 2016, so this is sort of just as I was coming into academia, I started my PhD in 2016, there was this campaign called Bar Bar Plot where they were trying to encourage people to move away from bar plots to look at other things. Um, and this was sort of a big thing in 2016. It sort of died down a bit, but it's, you know, their message is still the same. Um, I'm not going to play this video for you now because I'm going to say a lot of the things that they say in the video, but I've just provided the link to this video, which you can access via the slides on the OSF, because it's quite a good introduction to the things that I am going to talk about. Okay, so what I'm now going to focus on is the issues with bar plots. Um, most of us, I think, when we sort of start data visualization, and for a lot of people, this is maybe when you're doing your bachelor's or undergraduate degree and you start having data that you want to plot, 
Um, one of the first things that we're taught about is bar plots. And bar plots are essentially just bars of the mean value. It could be a different central tendency value like the median, but it tends to be a bar height is equivalent to the mean. Um, and use of bar plots is highly pervasive um, within research and the academic community, but they're not really the best things to be visualizing your data with. And I'm gonna show you four reasons to tell why they are not great. The first reason is that bar plots can hide your sample size. So if you were to look at this bar plot here, which I've just mocked up, it's made up data, and you were to look at these group differences, you would think, gosh, you know, that child bar looks to be a lot higher than that adult bar. There's probably some kind of significant or, you know, large difference going on here. But if I was then to tell you that the sample sizes of these two groups were three and 30, you probably start to think, mm, okay, like, okay, maybe then these are just three badly performing adults and are actually that different to the child group. There's not really a reliable difference. But if you just pop your bar plots alone, then you're not going to get this information about sample size and sample variance. And one thing that you might be thinking is, yes, but Sophie, I use error bars of my standard deviation or my standard error or some kind of error bar measure. Um, on top of my bar plots and you know this sort of gets around this issue and it is indeed the case that if you have a small sample size you will have a much larger error bar because there is much more variance so if we were then to add on error bars to these two sample sizes of 3 and 30 we see that the error bar of the uh, n equals 3 group is like much larger these error bars overlap and we therefore think okay maybe there is not a large or reliable difference between these two groups and this is for a lot of us we're kind of like brought up with this tendency to not trust large error bars kind of like how it says in this meme here we like our error bars to be small we somehow seem to think this is like better and more reliable and it is indeed true that we should be more suspicious of large error bars but one thing that I really want to get at is you really should be trusting no error bars when all you are given is the error bars alone, because these can also be misleading in the sense that they don't tell you about the full data set. And this is because many different distributions can lead to the same bar plot. So this is a really great example of this here. If you take a normal distribution and a logarithmic distribution, these are very different. You know, normal is a bell curve. A logarithmic is like this. So you can clearly tell they have different distributions. But if you were just to take the mean and the standard deviation of these two samples, they are the same. They are both 100 as a mean. And if you were to just plot the mean and the standard deviation in a bar plot with error bars, then you are, it's not to say hiding, but it is in a sense, you are not showing off all the information that you have available in your data sets. And I don't think anybody would argue that these data sets are the same, you know, they're clearly very different in terms of their distribution, but if you just have a bar plot alone, then you're not getting this full variance of information. You know, just sort of going on the same point here, that many distributions can lead to the same bar plot. When we look at a bar plot, such as the one seen in A, we tend to implicitly assume that there is a symmetrical distribution underlying the two um, data sets that we see in those two bar plots. So we, when we look at A, you tend to assume that the underlying data looks like B. But in actual fact, many different distributions could create that bar plot in A. There could be an outlier in the white bar condition, which is driving the mean of that condition to go up. Um, we also presume that all the data points are probably centered around the mean, i.e. at the top of the graph. But actually, it could be that there is a bimodal distribution, as you see in D. So you actually have these sort of different things going on, which makes you think, okay, there might be something else going on in my data. And you're just not getting this if you look at bar plots and error bars alone. Um, and just sort of really sort of hammering home this point, this is a really great GIF um, by the people who created this data source set. What this is basically showing you is that you can have many different distributions and here they're doing some quite cool shapes like stars and dinosaurs which create very different visual images when you uh, plot all the data points on the x and the y but in actual fact the mean and the standard deviations of these x and these y values for all these different shapes that they're showing is exactly the same and if you just plot um that alone in a bar plot like you kind of see on the right here 
then you just won't understand the full breadth of what is going on in your data. And I think that will sort of be a theme going on through sort of the data, different data visualizations that I show you today is you want to show off everything that you have. You know, when we collect experimental data, quite often a lot of effort goes into collecting this data. And to sort of put it in a bar plot, I think is doing it somewhat of a disservice to you and the data. Okay. So the third issue with power plots is that they do not provide information about consistency across individuals. So if you were to look at um, the plot A here, you think, okay, there's quite a big condition difference. And we somewhat assume, same as is within participant design, that all participants are probably showing the same direction of the effect on a similar-ish magnitude. So they're all sort of showing a higher score for the white compared to the black bar. So we sort of assume it looks like B. And this is what the error bar sort of misleads us to believe. When in actual fact, there could be a hell of a lot of variance going on within the participant effects. And it could be that there are very few participants, like you see in C and D, that are driving this larger mean condition difference. But there are, in fact, some participants that aren't showing any effect or going in the opposite direction. Um, and this is sort of showing the same idea, but this is also really useful at sort of explaining why and um, how this can sort of lead to statistically different effects. So if you look at the figure on the left, you have, you know, these bar um, charts, which don't look to be showing a large difference in height, but you see a lot of consistency across individuals in terms of the red lines. And indeed, you know, coming from this paper here, you know, they did a t-test and they have a statistically significant difference. Whereas if you look at the figure on the right, these error, these sorry, these bar charts are the same height, but there is a lot more variance across participants. There doesn't look to be a lot of consistency in terms of the effect between people. And in this case, there is no statistical significant difference. And I think this really highlights why it is important that you also plot individual effects if you are going to analyze or model your data in this way. Because it could be if you just plot the mean effects with a bar plot. And, you, and it looks like your bar plots have a really large height difference. So you probably get excited and you're like, oh, yes, I think I'm going to find a significant difference. And then you do your analysis and you don't get a significant difference. So you might think something's gone wrong. You know, maybe your analysis, you did the wrong analysis or whatever. But it may be that actually, although you have this mean difference, you don't have a lot of consistency across individuals. And there's very few participants that's actually driving this mean difference. So then if you had plotted the individual effects as well, then you wouldn't be so surprised when you then maybe do not see a statistically significant effect. Okay, so the fourth issue that I'm going to talk about, and I promise this is the last one, or this is in two parts, is that bar plots can distort data interpretation. And one thing is this thing called the truncation effect. And there's this really great study that came out a few months ago. And in this study, they show participants two figures. They show them the one on the left. And on this figure on the left, you can see that the y-axis starts at zero. So it starts at zero, and there's a lot more spread across the y-axis. So it looks like all the bars are closer together. Whereas if you look at the figure on the right, these are the exact same values. If you, if you were to take the individual values for these four countries, Portugal, Greece, Cyprus, and Malta, they're the exact same as you see in the figure on the left. But in this case, they have truncated the bar graph. So this means they've locked off the bottom of it, and the y-axis is now showing a smaller spread of numbers. So it's only going, looks to be from about 15 to 28, whereas the other one is going from zero. And they asked participants, they showed participants either one of these graphs, and they said, how different do you judge the values on the bar graph to be? So in this case, how, how much of a difference is there between these different countries? And in reality, remember that the values are exactly the same between these two figures on the left and the right. But what they found is that people perceive there to be a greater difference between the figure on the right compared to the figure on the left. And this is because in that example, they truncated the axis, they locked it off and they spread it out. And this is what's known as the truncation effect. And it's just something that you have to be really careful of when you are visualizing your data, because if someone comes and looks at your visualization, who, you know, it's the first time they're seeing about your data set, you can um, inadvertently mislead them into thinking certain things 
if you sort of really spread out your y-axis or really sort of squished it together, you just have to be really careful. Um, and so a really good example of the, tr the truncation effect in real life, you can see here two pictures taken from US news about the Obamacare enrollment. And what you see is that on the figure on the left, they um, have not truncated the axes. No, no, sorry, they have truncated the axes on the figure on the left. They also don't appear to have any um, y-axis labels either. But that's a different point. And you can see here that there looks to be a really vast difference between the two bar heights. And you maybe look at this if you're a TV viewer and think, gosh, it looks like, you know, Obamacare enrollment is a long way off its target goal. But if you were to look, if you were watching TV and you were to see the figure on the right, in which case here, you know, they start their y-axis at zero, they're not truncating it. And then these, the heights of these bars look visually to be more similar in space. And you would therefore maybe come to believe, oh, okay, like it doesn't actually look like Obamacare is that far off its enrollment. And that's why we have to be really careful with using bar plots uh, because we don't want to unintentionally mislead people. Okay, so the other issue with bar plots and how they can distort data interpretation is this thing called the within the bar bias. Um, so this was a study done a few years ago, but I know it's been replicated a few times. And in this study, they show participants um, bars that look like this. So they have a bar height and then a red dot above it. And they ask them to judge the likelihood of a particular data point being part of the underlying distribution. So how likely is a red dot to be part of the underlying distribution represented by the bar? And what they found is that participants judge the points to be more likely to fall within the underlying distribution if it was contained with in the bar, so A or D, but they judge it to be more likely to be outside of the underlying distribution if they looked at figures B and C. But in reality, the height of, sorry, the distance of the red dot from the top of the bar is the same across all of these conditions. It's the same in A and B. It is equidistance from the height of the bar, which is sort of signaling the mean. Um, but you still get this within the bar bias as if somehow the bar contains the relevant information. And these people, that the, the participants in the study, these were statistics and mathematics students. So they are people who really do know what an underlying distribution is and they know what a mean is. They know that the mean is the average and therefore there will be points above and below it. And yet still they are also misled into this within the bar bias that something above the um, height of the bar is somehow more outside of it is potentially more of an outlier and less likely to be part of the underlying distribution. Um, and this is what has been termed the zone of irrelevance. When we look at bar plots, even though we know in our heads, you know, we all know what a mean is, we can easily forget this when we look at a bar chart. And this is because bar graphs arbitrarily assign importance to the height of a bar rather than focusing attention on how the difference between means compare to the observed values. So we want to often include raw data points like dot plots that you see in B and C so that we can also show yes data also exists up here because otherwise even though people may know this they may unintentionally be misled. Um, you may have noticed though that in this result I've shown here they talk about the zone of irrelevance at the bottom at the bottom of the graph graph and in C they suggest you sort of lock this off which goes somewhat against um, what we said oh, sorry not, not what we said what the authors said a few slides ago about their recommendation not to truncate axes um, and just to sort of say a bit more on this these authors specifically say that their recommendation not to truncate is specific to bar charts whereas line graphs and dot plots that do not represent numerical values as continuous visual areas, which is what you do with a bar graph, um, um, in these cases, truncation may actually be more appropriate. So this sort of goes into when you're making a data visualization, there's not necessarily a black and white answer and a right and wrong way to do things. So you have to think about what is appropriate for your data. So are you working with categorical or continuous data, for example, what is appropriate for uh, sort of your design maybe of your study or the type of data that you have and just to be careful of how somebody would come to view your data if they came at it for the first time. 
Okay, so that is sort of my summary of bar plots or why they are not that great. Does anyone have any questions about that before I then go on to talk about the cooler stuff, which is what we should do instead of bar plots? But does anyone have any questions first? Someone says, great example. Thank you. Okay, well, feel free to butt in at any time if you have anything you'd like to ask. Okay, so thinking about what we can do instead is that, <laughs> no, your life is not useless for only doing bar and line graph. Don't worry. There's many more exciting things. Um, okay, so um, what the main thing I want to get at, and I'm probably getting at anyway, is that you have so much data, you want to show it off. If you are just plotting your mean as bar heights and your error blood, these are just your summary statistics. And it is quite possible they are hiding something more interesting and something you have put a lot of time and effort into collecting. So you really want to sort of be showing off your data in the way that allows you to show off more than just your summary statistics. And there are lots and lots of options available to you to be able to do this. I'm not going to go through this um, table in detail because it's a bit small and it's got lots of words on it, but I provided a link to this um, table because it's quite a good resource if you're sort of trying to specifically think, okay, I have this data set with maybe this sample size or this type of variable, what would maybe be the best answer for me and what is the best practice when I am doing this visualization. As I said, I'm not gonna go through this in detail, but it's a good resource. But there are lots of options for what you can do um, instead of, or as well as a bar plot. So for example, there is a box plot in which you have your medium, and then you have your uh, upper and lower quartiles and your uh, maximum minimum quartiles as well. Um, this is also sometimes called a box and whisker plot. Um, and then you also have a dot plot. This is essentially where you point your raw data points or your individual participant effects as individual dots. Then you also have a violin or bean distribution, which shows the probability of a, um, which shows the probability of where the data points fall within that area. So basically the fatter the violin, the higher the likelihood that data points fall within this area. Whereas if it is thinner, there is a lower probability that data points fall within this area. Um, but just to highlight, even these alternatives to bar plots, none of these should be used alone. The best approach is a combinational method. And this is because all of these different visualizations have their own advantages and trade-offs. And it is most desirable if you combine these. That is how you will best show off your data. And just to sort of hammer home that point again, this is another GIF that's showing you that you can have the same box plot, so sort of the same medium value and the same upper and lower quartiles, but this can be caused by different raw data points and different violin and bean distributions. So it's not just bar plots I'm picking on, although I did sort of spend a long time talking about the pitfalls of bar plots because they are often the most commonly used, but really is that none of these should be used alone. Um, so the best approach is to combine these different things. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that you have to combine all of them. I probably advise against ideally we'll do something that shows your summary statistics. So that's something like a bar plot, a box plot, or error bars. And you also want to do something that shows about your underlying distribution and the raw data. So that's either like a violin plot or a dot plot with participant effects. So what I'm going to show you now is I'm going to show you three different alternatives to bar plots that combine these different things and they don't all combine the same things they're different options and then I will talk you through the R code for being able to make this. Okay so the first alternative is something called a jitter plot um, and what a jitter plot has is it includes a bar chart which has the the group means and standard error bars or any sort of error bars and then it also has on top of this and um, the participant mean so those are the individual gray dots and it also shows the participant effects so, so the lines connecting the participant effects within different conditions 
Um, and just to highlight, you know, there is still a place for bar plots as long as you do not use them alone. Bar plots here are still providing information about the overall means and the summary statistics. But on top of that, you also have this additional information about the participant effects. And it's called a jitter plot because you have to jitter the dots so that they are not all on top of each other. So they're all sort of at slightly different distances from the center point and sort of jittered around that. Okay. The next alternative is something called a pirate plot. Um, pirate plots um, are really powerful in a way because you'll see when I show you that you need quite a minimal amount of code to be, sorry, it's quite a short amount of code that you need to then be able to create a plot which can show you a lot of what's going on in your data. And a pirate plot includes a group central tendency measure. So that's the black line in the middle. And you can set the central tendency to be the mean, the medium, or the mode. Um, then you also have surrounding these um, central tendency line, you have these boxes, which are showing you the 95% confidence intervals. Then you have the raw data points, which are the things that kind of look like bubbles. And then you also have the violin or bean distribution showing the probability of the distribution around this. Okay, and the third alternative that I'm going to show you the code for is something called a rain cloud plot. Um, rain cloud plots are probably one I use the most often. I find them quite useful. And a rain cloud plot includes a violin distribution, first of all. Um, it's only a half violin because by product of what a violin distribution is, it is exactly symmetrical. So you only technically need half of the violin to be able to show you about the probability and spread of the data. So you're not losing any information by only having a half violin because they are symmetrical. Then rain cloud plots also include a box plot which shows the medium values and the upper and lower quartiles. And then they also include the raw data points. They are called rain cloud plots because if you On the y-axis and you can also if you wish show your participant effects by joining up the dots so there's a lot that you can do within a rain cloud plot okay so before i move into the r script one thing that i just want to highlight is that if you have been making bar plots until now you haven't been doing anything wrong and um, the use of bar plots is highly pervasive within sort of the science community, the academic community, um, maybe within the industry, I'm less knowledgeable on that, but you know, you do see a lot of bar plots, like you see them on the TV a lot as well. Um, so if you're making bar plots, you haven't done anything wrong. It's just that now, hopefully through this talk, I can provide you with more information about data visualization, the tools to be able to do better data visualization that you will now be able to sort of improve your data. Um, figures. And just to sort of highlight that, this on the left is a figure that I made in 2016. Uh, this figure is part of my first ever first author publication. And I'm incredibly proud of this publication because it was my first one. And thus I am in part proud of this figure. But in many ways, I'm not proud of this figure because it is not the figure that I would make today now that I have all this other information available to me about better data visualizations. And for example, I made this figure last year, which I think is quite a bit of an improvement. You know, it's showing off lots to do with my full data set. I'm really showing off both the summary statistics as well as the underlying distribution and raw data points. So please don't think when I've been saying these things, I've sort of been, you know, picking on you if you have been making bar plots. I have not. Um, it's just now, hopefully, I can provide you with the tools that I have learned over the last four or five years that then maybe you can also take and apply to your data. Sophie, there's, there was just a question in the yeah. chat for you. What is the number in the box box on the right? Um, in the box plots. Oh, are you referring to this figure here or the box plot that I showed in the rain cloud plot? Oh, I know what you're referring to, sorry referring to my figure here yes sorry yes so this is a uh, one that i made personally and um, so i wanted because a box plot is the um 
median it has the line in the middle of the box what is the medium i wanted to also plot the means because when i was talking about these effects in my collaborators i was talking about the mean values so sort of you know there's a um 20 millisecond um priming effect in the production to production but there's no priming effect in the comprehension to production so that's why in addition to having a um box plot with the medium i also added on the mean value so yes, yeah, so you don't have to necessarily just do what the package tells you. So if you Google rain cloud plots, there's all these great resources, but they don't include the mean values. And I was like, I also want to do that. So you can add on your own things, definitely. Okay, I hate that helps. They are constructed using different data. Um, no, they're all constructed using the same data. Um, I calculated the means from that data and added it on, but they're all constructed using, oh, the, do you mean the figures on the left and the right? Yeah, the figures on the left and the right are constructed using different data. These are entirely different studies. Sorry, sometimes hard to sort of quite get the questions. Sorry, that's my fault. Yes, they are from completely different studies. The figure on the left was a categorical variable, so it's working in proportional effects. The figure on the right is a continuous variable. Yes, okay. So in the R session that I'm going to move into now, um, I'm going to show you how to make these three different plots, jitter, pirate, and rain cloud plots. Um, I think jitter plots tend to be more appropriate if you're working with categorical or discrete variables, um, and pirate plots and rain cloud plots are really good for continuous variables. Um, the main packages that I'm going to be using to make these are ggplot, the yar package, and rain cloud plots. Rain cloud plots is not a package that is yet available in the R repository. You have to download it from GitHub. But I'll explain how to do that. Um, and if you're interested as to why they are called pirate plots, I actually learned this recently. The guy who created the YAR package, he called it YAR because if you say R like you are a bit of a pirate, it sounds like YAR. So he just made this whole package surrounded by this whole pirate theme. And seeing as he is the inventor of these plots, he decided to call them pirate plots to fit in within his yar and pirate theme. So that is why. Not because they look like pirates, where it's rain cloud plots, you can kind of see where that's coming from. Okay. Um, and just before we start, some general tips for working in R. You can always Google the problem. R, I think, has one of the best online communities. Like you're being part of the online community now by coming to these talks. And somebody will most likely have asked the question before, uh, maybe on something like stack overflow or stat exchange. So if you Google it, it's quite possible that you can find a solution to your problem. And secondly, always comment your code. This makes me very obvious, but if you make a figure and then you come back to it a few months later, you know, future you will be very grateful to past you for commenting your code. Um, in R, you can assign variables using either an arrow sign or an equals. I just point this out because it is more common that you see people using the arrow thing, the arrow symbol, but I use the equals. It's just a personal preference. I don't see too many other people doing it. So if you do see the equals in the scripts that I provided, don't be confused. It's just sort of the way I, I assign things. Um, fourthly, packages are your friend. I'm going to be using a number of packages today. They are really useful because it means that you don't have to go to all the effort to create your own functions. You can just choose functions that other people have already used. And finally, I would say watch out for data types when you're doing data visualizations. And this can often be the cause of coding errors. For example, if you have what you believe is a numerical variable, but for whatever reason, R is not recognizing this as numerical, maybe it's recognizing it as a factor or a string, then it's not going to be able to plot it um, along a continuous axis. So you can quite easily change the data type. You just change the, um, you just see as done numeric instead. But I just point this out because it's a thing that I think causes people a lot of uh, frustration, sometimes including me, when you can't understand why your figure is not plotting, when really it's quite a simple solution. And okay, so that is it for the sort of slide part of my talk. And uh, before I move in to the um, coding bit, does anyone have any questions? Going to wait a bit longer this time for questions because last time I think I was too quick and people were still talking. If I do that, Beth has her hand up. Beth, would, would you want to unmute yourself? Ah, 
Yeah. Hi, Sophie. Yeah. This is great. Thank you so much. Um, I'm curious about your thoughts on it. So one way in which I can view bar plots as being really useful is that a lot of people would understand how to interpret them. And so I'm curious about how like using less common plots, particularly if you're um, trying to communicate to like a non-expert audience, yeah. how that, in, how even though there's more information contained, how it might, it might make it harder for people to, to interpret it because they don't know where to begin with that plot. Uh, yeah, I think that's a really um, good question because I guess I was sort of thinking more like, so, you know, if you were doing a publication, then I think it's really important. But you're right. If you are giving a public talk, then you may be more like, I want to get a certain message across. In which case, I think maybe there is a still a place for bar plots. And you'll see one of the things that make, does contain a bar plot but you may want to be um, wary of not doing certain things like truncating your axes. And also, I still think you can include additional information. So like with the jitter, you still have the bar plots going on, but you have the individual data points. And maybe you would think it would be a little bit too much, you know, visual overload to join up the dots. But maybe you could just still have these individual dots showing that there is this variance. And I think you're right, people love mean values. And I also find mean values really good to work with, which is why in this example here, you know, I also included little diamonds of the mean. Um, so yes, I think if you are presenting to public or non-specialist audiences, you definitely want to use summary statistics in a clear way. But I think there is also scope to be able to include more, but still keep clear and clarity within that. So you can still include other things, but maybe you would want to make sure it's definitely clear what the mean values are. Does that sound like a good thing? Because actually that's a really important thing to think about. You're right. And I hadn't spent a huge amount of time thinking about, but yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. I was just curious about how that might've like been factored into this discourse. I, I um, have done a lot of work in conservation. So have done mm -hmm. a lot of communicating to non-expert audiences. So, so just, yeah, kind of curious as to how that fit into all this, but that's a great answer. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Does anyone else have any questions at all? You are welcome to unmute yourself. Following on from best point, is there an anti-bar plot bias in academia now? Um, Unfortunately, no, not really. Um, so when I, so certain people, um, so when I review papers, if I get a figure that looks like this, and I'm perfectly aware that this is one of my own figures from a number of years ago, but if I get a figure that looks like this when I'm reviewing the paper, what I will do is I will very politely say, um, you know, there are disadvantages to using bar plots alone, maybe you consider alternative ways to visualize your data. And what I tend to do is I very often link people to these very good papers. Um, I can't remember this person's first name, but Wiz Gerbert, she has lots of very good resources. And when I write my reviews, I'll very often, very often provide citations to these and say, I would advise maybe doing this instead. Um, and I think there are people out there like me who also call people up uh, when they see suboptimal data visualizations in publications, but it's not going to prohibit your um, paper from being published. And there are still lots of people who would not comment on that. So no, there is definitely not an anti-bar plot bias. Um, I think it's more about trying to increase awareness about alternative ways in which we could do it. So I hope that answers your question. Um, and the next question is, please can you explain again how to read violin plots? Okay, so I'm going to go back to this figure here. I'm actually going to make this bigger because then I might have to change the thing. So a violin plot shows the spread of your distribution. So how likely it is that the raw data points fall within a particular area? So you have a wider spread of the violin, so it's basically fatter, when there is a higher probability that the underlying data points fall within this area. When it is thinner, like it is at the bottom, well, it's often at the bottom, 
um, then there is a lower probability that your data points fall within this area. So that's probably more where your outliers lie. They are called violins because they are very often this typical shape because very often our data does tend to be um, spread around the mean and they kind of look like violins. Um, and just to sort of um, show that with this here, you can see from the raw data points that most of the raw data points are around the fattest part of the violin. So these using raw data points and violin distributions are complementary. They will sort of often I can't think of a situation in which they would contradict each other. If maybe you had a bimodal distribution, then it wouldn't look like a violin. It would look like two, two humps, basically. And you would have the raw data points underneath each hump. Um, but yes, they show the probability. Does that answer your question? Great, okay. Does anyone else have a question at all? Okay, uh, well, you can continue typing your questions if anyone is typing while I get the next slide ready. Um, for a newbie, does R offer any value for presenting data for a research paper? Um, if I've interpreted your question wrong, feel free to unmute yourself and text something else. Are you saying does R offer anything over alternative like Excel? Um, the data is descriptive statistics. So it is true that you can make a bar plot alone in Excel uh, very straightforwardly, but it would be very difficult to do all these additional data visualization things that I am going to show you in Excel alone. Um, definitely, though, you can do these things in other languages like Python or MATLAB if you prefer. So it's not necessarily that you have to do these visualizations in R. There are other programs that you could use, but it would be hard to do it in without using one of these slightly high level programming languages. Although I say high level, it's not like it's overly complex coding, as I'm hopefully going to show you today. But I think there is a lot of value in learning R because um, it's really good for data wrangling, data visualization and data analysis. And the thing that is great about R, as well as Python, I would add, is that they are free. So you do not have to be relying on a university license or a company license to be able to use them. This is not the case for alternatives like MATLAB and SPSS, which is why I would always encourage the use of R or Python um, for general um, data wrangling and visualization purposes. Like, for example, if I um, was to maybe, you know, move universities or leave academia altogether, I can take my R skills with me <laughs> because R is free to download. I can use it wherever I want. Um, but um, if I had maybe been doing this in MATLAB, which I do use for some other data analysis, and then I went to a company that didn't want to pay the license for MATLAB, then those skills I had would be a bit lost. So I think there is a lot of value in learning R, um, not just for, vi for visualization, just for generally. Someone has said R is a piece of cake compared to Visual Basic and DAX. Yes, um, I don't know about these two alternatives, but I would say that because of how great the online resources is, um, I think it is in some ways easier to learn R. So, yes. In that scenario, because you are from research background, you will understand very, very well. So mm -hmm. you think that, uh, because I haven't really tried R earlier, but I'm a bit familiar with Java, etc. So I, I understand basics of programming. Yes. And right now I am writing a paper and I have some data. Mm -hmm. uh, that is descriptive. If the person was working in a company since X, Y, Z years, what were the skills that they had, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And now I have done two types of uh, data collection. One is quantitative and another qualitative. Mm -hmm. Qualitative, obviously, I'll present via thematic analysis, depending on their views. It is the question of that I am getting stuck on that how do I present this quantitative data, this survey data? That is what I am stuck at. And that is the reason that brings me to your workshop. <laughs> okay, so I really hope that I will provide 
And, and, if, and if I'm taking because everyone, 40, I don't want to uh, 43 people to listen or if they're not interested. So, and I can con uh, continue this conversation outside the uh, this workshop. No. You you have to spend your time in uh, showing in whatever you ha have to show. And I really don't want to consume all the time. <laughs> no, I, can, I, can, I can continue the chat later, I'll be honest, because I really respect your time and I really respect the time of 43 <laughs> people who have come to this workshop to learn very valuable skills and valuable knowledge that you are sharing. So I can continue the conversation later. Later, yeah i can yes, that's okay but you are also I, I have already i have already opened your website and i was just type, <laughs> going to type in the contact for my i thought okay let not let me not be shy and just ask her i'll still yeah. type in my query yeah and we can continue yeah. the conversation yeah, out no today. yeah no yeah that sounds great um but yeah no i think there are definitely hopefully some ways you can learn about visualization which means you get unstuck from this problem you are having got it, got but it. you can of course also yeah. message Got it. Th thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, You're very I will, welcome. I'll let you get on and I'll learn more. Thank you. Thanks a okay. lot. God bless you. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, unless there are any other questions, I think we will move on to this coding part of the workshop. Um, so, this is an, our markdown file. If you attended, I think it was our last workshop, was on our markdown by Thea. Um, this is, well, lots of the skills that Thea talked about is how I made this R Markdown script. I don't tend to use R Markdown that often when I'm actually doing visualization. I just tend to use a normal R script because I'm like playing around with lots of things. But for the purpose of this tutorial, um, an R Markdown script offer me a lot neater and clearer way to present this information to you. And yes, Marion has again shared the link in the chat. So please do, if you want to take this, um, Markdown for yourself, and then you literally can just copy the code that you see in the grey boxes and put it into your own R script. Um, and this uh, file here it has sort of hyperlinks to different points. So that's it's just nicely, nicely set up to show you the different types of plots. And the aim is to show you how to do a jitter plot, a pirate plot, and a rain cloud plot so that you can then take it and apply it to your own data. And um, before you do any of these plots, you of course want to make sure that you have the required packages. As I said, packages are your friends. There are a number of different packages that are used here to make the plot. So like ggplot and yar, but I also just use some extra packages like tidyverse to do other things, not specifically related to the plotting, but which are very useful to get to the plotting stage. And if you don't already have these installed, you need to use the install packages function. Okay, so the first thing that I'm going to talk about are jitter plots. Um, as I said, jitter plots, um, you can't, you could use them for continuous data, but they are particularly useful for categorical data. And before you make your plot, you want to load in your data set and check it looks as you expect. And by looks, I don't necessarily mean visualize in terms of figure, I just mean check the structure. And here I am instead using simulated data instead of um, providing you with data because it's just easier within the markdown context with a categorical variable. So basically yes or no. And I've just simulated this using um, the sample function. So we have these different conditions of A and B and these different groups of child and adults. And then I've just randomly uh, selected some probabilities to assign to the yes and the no. And if you look at the structure of the data file using the struct function, this is very key for making sure that uh, your data is the correct type. So for example, it's numeric for the response, um, just to make sure that everything's okay. Um, the correct was yes and no. I just converted that into binary, so one or zero for the purpose of visualization, but it still corresponds to the no and the yes in the same way. Um, I would then advise before you start plotting that you use the view or the head function to look at the rows of your data set. So this head just presents the first few lines. Well, all I'm doing here is just checking that it looks, uh, the data file looks as I'd expect, particularly if you have been working in an alternative program, or alternative space, maybe in Excel, or maybe you've downloaded your data from somewhere entirely different, like an online place. You just want to make sure that nowhere has it got lost in translation and now you know the data file is somehow messed up. These are just sort of um, checking methods for peace of mind. And also you probably, if you're working with a categorical, you just want to check your frequency. So this just checks the frequencies of the no and yes responses per group, per condition. Okay, 
So lastly, before you start plotting, you would want to make a new data frame of your summary statistics. This is useful both for checking your data and we will use this when we are creating the um, digital plot. So what I have used here is a tidyverse pipeline. So these are just pipes um, to take the data, group it by group and condition, and then summarize the mean standard deviation standard error values. So then you just get this nice little table that looks like this. And here, the mean corresponds to the proportion of correct responses. Okay, so now we move on to the next bit, which is making the plot. Making a jitter plot and any GG plot in R is really all about adding the layers. So you literally just assemble it layer by layer. And doing it in layers also helps it make life easier for you because then it is easier to identify your mistakes. And the first layer is creating a basic bar plot. And at this first stage, the most important thing to pay attention to is your AES. And AES stands for your aesthetic mappings. And it is in this here that you specify your data frame that you are using to make the plot. So we are using the summary data frame. And you say what you want the X value to be. So we want to be conditioned, the Y value, the fill. And fill is the same as X, just so that we can have different colors for the different conditions as well. Then also I'm using classic grid to say do different little figures for the two different groups, so for the child and the adult group. And all up to this point is just setting up your figure. You haven't actually done anything to create a figure yet. You're just setting up the environment in terms of what your variables are and how you wish to use them in different ways. And then it is this last line here that actually creates the bar. So this geom bar function. And stat equals identity signals to the uh, plot to map the y value to the bar height. So here we just have the mean value with the bar height. So, yeah, so this is a basic bar plot, which is your first layer. But if you have been listening to anything that I have said in my previous slides, please do not stop at this layer. Please keep going. There are many more exciting layers. <laughs> okay, so the next layer is where you want to add your error bars. And um, here I'm doing it with standard error, but you can maybe do this with standard deviation or even with confidence intervals. And the first thing that you need to do is you need to specify your limits of your error bars. R does not automatically know how high or how low to make your error bars. So you specify this using again, the aesthetic mappings thing, and you say what you want the maximum and minimum Y value. So basically where on the Y axis should the error bars end? And this is, in this case, the mean plus the SE or the mean minus the SE. These two variable names, mean and SE, they re relate directly to the summary data frame. They are called mean and SE. If you have called them different things, you would want to call them differently in your limits function, okay? So it's not, even though that is what it would always be, if you had different variable names, just be careful. And then you very simply take the figure that we made above, so J1, J1, and you add on your error bars. So this little bit of code here is basically saying, using the value of limits, add those on as error bars to the bar plot that I already have. And here I'm just specifying the size in terms of the thickness and the width of the error bars. So this is a still a fairly basic bar plot, but now we also have some, some error bars on it. And now we start getting to the interesting layers. Layer three is when you want to add individual data points. And for this, you first need to create a new data frame of each participant's individual average per condition. And um, doing this is exactly the same as the previous pipeline that I used to create the summary data frame, except now that we're also grouping by condition, sorry, grouping by participant. So we have the PP value here, which means that we are also going to do individual participant means and standard deviations for each group and each condition. So now you can see your participant one to six, six, this is just looking at the head of the data, what is their um, mean and standard deviation proportion of correct responses in condition A for these various children. But there will be a lot more data rows below it, this is just the head. And now we want to take this individual data frame and we want to add it as more data points to another layer on top of our existing plot. And the most important thing when adding this layer is thinking about how far from the center line you want the individual data points to be. 
basically refers to how close together or far away the data points are from the center line. If you have a dodge value of zero, the raw data points will all be in the same in horizontal there, I think it's vertical. They'll all be in the same, yeah, they'll all be in the same vertical space, which means they will all overlap and they will therefore obstruct each other. But you want to jitter them about so that they are not overlapping. And the other important thing when you're adding this there, like in the aesthetic mapping, the AES, you're using a new data frame. So this individual data frame to your previous layers, which uses summary data frame. And you should also group adding this new mappings and grouping by participant. This is important because this means that R treats each data, each participant's data individually, which is very important next step when we, when we then want to add the individual effects, i.e. joining the dots, because unless R knows which data points belong to which participant, it's not going to know which dots to join up. So yeah, so this is the position dodge. Here I've used normal. 0.3, so it sort of goes a 0.3 spread. And um, if you wanted to make them sort of more spread out, you would use a larger value. So you want to spread them out across the whole width of the bar. You would use a bigger value, maybe 0.6. And um, if I'm honest with you, I'm not entirely sure what this value relates to in space. Um, maybe somebody would know that. It's not like necessarily like a measurement like centimeters or anything like that. You just kind of maybe want to play around with this value until it's a jitter or a spread that you would like. And then you take your previous layer, J2, and you add this on. So you have GM points, which corresponds to individual dots. As I said, you want to change slightly the specification in your aesthetic mapping, specifying the shape and the size and the position dodge around the center point. So now we're having what looks to be If maybe you had a between participants design, so participants do not do condition A or B, then, or, you know, see, I'm, I'm, I'm referring this all to participants because I guess that's the background that I come from. I'm sure if you worked in a different area of research or different industry, you could think of an example in which it would be appropriate to join the dots and which would not be appropriate. But if it is appropriate for your design and your data to join the dots, you then want to add on this fourth layer. And you connect the dots using GM line. The really important thing here is to make sure that you use the same position dodge. So I previously set this as a value called PD, because otherwise, if you use a different dodge, then your data points, your lines will not line up. They will be in different points in space. And that's also why you have to use the group in the static mappings so that it knows, okay, these two dots here were maybe participant three. So here you now have a complete jitter plot. If you wanted, you could stop here. This is a very good, and very informative plot. But I think lots of people, me included, do like to make our graphs look a little bit prettier and maybe look a bit more individual. So there are a few things I'm just going to quickly go through for how you can change of your figure. So for example, you can make it pretty by changing the colors. So here I'm using scale fill manual have a purple and green bars. You can change the axis and the legend labels. So here we just have mean and condition. But to be honest with you, having mean is not really that informative. If you're just looking at a figure for the first time, you're probably like the mean of what? So I've changed my um, y-axis label to be the proportion of correct responses. And this is therefore a lot more informative if the figure is the first thing a person is looking at. I've also changed the x-axis label and the other thing I've done just in this case is to get rid of the um, legend, just because in this case, it repeats the x-axis information, but you may not necessarily want to do that. And lastly, you can change the background. Um, I think background is definitely a personal preference. You know, this is a very good figure. You do not necessarily have to change the background. Personally, I like to make my figure background white. Um, so this code here, which you could literally just copy and paste into your own code because it's not specific to any variables. All this does is it makes the background white of the grid labels and the underlying figure. It also does things like make the ticks black. So here you can say they're automatically a bit grayer, whereas I've just made them black. Um, it does a few other things like bold the outlines of the different boxes. So this is just sort of a way just to maybe make a bit more visually pleasing or how you would like visually. Uh, so okay. 
sorry. Ah, yeah. There was a question for you. I think one person was asking what the lines were telling. Yeah. Sorry, yes, I didn't really pay attention to the chat. <laughs> um, okay, so the lines, so connecting the lines here is talking about the individual participant effects. So say, for example, we have our children and they do condition A. Um, we can't think of so maybe in condition A they're showing um pictures of something and in condition B they're just played the audio so they, so maybe we'll have a video and just an audio condition and we're looking at and then you ask the question then you ask the children afterwards you know a question about what happened in the video or the audio and you're measuring their correct response say maybe you're interested in the effect of the modality of what they heard or saw um you might join up the dots and what this is showing you here is this effect of modality for the different participants so how did a participant perform in condition a you know they got more right in condition a and then they got less right in condition b so this is just showing you how participants perform in individual conditions because if you just had the dot plot alone so like this maybe there's a participant that went against the trend so maybe they did really badly in condition A, but then they did really well in condition B. Whereas there's all these other participants that are going in the direction that would, that sort of is suggested by the height of the bars. So you want to plot the individual effects to see if there are any participants maybe showing a different trend or doing something completely odd. Because if you had a participant that was down here and then the other data point was up here, you may start I think, hmm, okay, were they actually really showing the correct? Is a good point. I uh, specific they are um so yes, they are independent conditions, but it is part of a within participant design. So you're specifically interested in comparing. So if you're doing statistical analysis, we look at one and the other then I think it is useful if you're doing a within participants t-test maybe to look to plot the within participant individual effects. If for example you had a between participants design where it's entirely independent, so you had two groups of children who either did condition A or either did condition B, then it would not in any way be appropriate to join up your lines. It is only appropriate within certain um, data sets. Yes, you have your hand up. Yes, please clarify if I'm helping you. Hey, Sophie, I'm so sorry. Hi. Okay. Oh, over here. So, can can I use this this particular portion? If I'm showing one particular data, but let us say uh, I'm talking about, so I'm into a financial industry at the moment, mm -hmm. and uh, my data revolves around transactions based on uh, you know loans and and syndications and all that. So let us say if I have a cash flow. I'm showing, and let us say the data is showing a weekly trends. Uh, I, I can do the weekly trends on X axis and then connect the dots to show the, basically the line graph, which we used to show in uh, in old plain old Excel file. Mm -hmm. would, would that be okay? But what if I am showing, uh, let's say five different people who would, have con who would have applied that cash. I don't think I can connect these dots because the performance of these five people are independent to each other. Yes. So if they are five separate people whose performance is independent, then it may be no, more appropriate to not connect the dots. But in the example I've given here, these are not entirely independent because these two dots correspond to the same person. So they are different conditions, but they are from the same person. So in that way, they are related. It's not like you're going to, it, it would be inappropriate to join this dot to that dot because they are from completely different participants. But if within the realms of your data set and the information that you had, it is appropriate to connect the dots, then this is what you could do. Um, I'm not going to go about saying you should always connect the dots or not connect the dots because everybody's data set is unique. But there are times in which it is appropriate, um, sort of like the examples I've shown here, but then there's also times when it's not appropriate. So for example, the example you gave sounds like a time when it's not appropriate. I think this is where you just have to think about what your data is about before you then go and plot your figure. Does that help answer your question? It does, but then I have a follow-up question. Okay. Can I, when I'm reading these two uh, you know, lines, can I assume that 
for, for a child, primarily there is a degradation in performance from A to B. Uh, that stands true for adults as well, but there are certain outliers where the, the performance is actually increasing from A to B in, in possibly certain conditions, certain scenarios or certain aspects. Can I read these lines like that or you know, yes, something more? That is entirely the correct inference to make from this figure. So I just simulated this data set. I made it up. I know I did any sort of experiment with children and adults in these conditions. But yes, that is entirely correct inference to make in that there does appear to be a mean condition difference. But then there are some participants going in the opposite direction, like this example participant here. Um, so yes, and this is why it's important to visualize your whole data set, because if you'd have just done the bar plots alone, like here, then you wouldn't have known that there are some participants that appear to be backing the trend. So yes, you have correctly interpreted the made up figure. So, yes. Thank you so very much. This is really beautiful. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, does anyone else have any questions? I see Suzanne has, send, has said my eyes. I think she's referring to my beautiful garish colors of purple and green which maybe one day I will use in a publication, but probably not. It's probably advisable not to. Yeah, very nice to see. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Okay, so now we're going to move on to talk about pirate plots. So um, pirate plots are better to be used maybe with continuous data. Um, so here I am instead simulating a continuous Set with a con sorry, a data set with continuous dependent variables. So in this case, it's a reaction time measure, so RT. I'm using a similar sort of um, setup to simulate the data as before, except now I'm just using the R norm function with different means and standard deviations per condition. Um, yeah, but other than that, the structure of the data set it looks very similar to before. You have group, the condition, but now it just has RT as our dependent variable. And this is again just looking at the head of the data set and here I have made a summary data frame you don't use your summary data frame when you are creating a pirate plot unlike with the jitter plot but I would still very much advise you create one using maybe a tiny first pipeline because it's still useful information to have about your data before you then go and visualize it or still have to hand after you visualize it you just want to know all these things about your data so I've just done the summaries of the mean the median because it's a continuous variable and then also the standard deviation the standard error which you can see here for the reaction times for the different conditions and groups so now to make a pirate plot making a basic pirate plot is actually exceedingly straightforward you need very little code which i'll show you in a minute but if you want to include more things or make your pirate plot look a bit different you have to add on more code and it's not like a jitter plot or gg plot where you add layers, instead you just add lines of code to the code above. So it's sort of all still within one thing. So you can't add things on, you just have to have a slightly lengthier code. So in order to make a basic uh, pirate plot, the most important thing is to specify your formula. So you're in the first line, you want to specify your formula. And this basically refers to the relationships between your different variables. So first of all, you specify your dependent variable, and then you can specify up to three independent variables. Unfortunately, a parent plot would not allow you to have more than three independent variables. If you do, you maybe just want to make two different parent plots for your fourth or fifth um, independent variable. So here we can see our formula is reaction times plus condition and plus group. So this is sort of the two independent variables and that's a dependent variable. And then you specify the data, so here we're using the PDAP and the theme. Pirate Plot has three different themes that you can play around with. I've just used theme two here. And this creates you, with, as I said, very little code, a plot that looks like this, that has all this information available to you. So maybe if you were new to R, this would be a particularly good place to start because with very little code, you can create a plot that includes both summary statistics. So you have your central tendency measure, your 95% confidence intervals, and as well, you have your individual data points and your violin distribution. But there might be other things that you want to change about this plot visually. So I'm just going to show you ways to change things visually and to also maybe add things in. So for example, you could change the color palette. There are lots of options available. If you see the resources at the bottom of this file, there's a link to where you can find out about the different color palettes. 
you can also remove the grid line. So here I have the same code as above, except I've added in these two extra lines where I have, I'm using the Espresso palette. I don't know why it's called that, it just is. And then I'm also setting the opacity of the grid lines to zero. So then you can see that the grid lines go away and the colors change and now I have blue and yellow compared to here where I had grid lines and red and blue. Um, the next thing that's probably more, more important and maybe something that we more want to do is change the properties of the different features of the pirate plot. So the features refer to the central tendency line, the inference band, so the box around the central tendency, the bean spread and the raw data points. And for each of these, you could change the opaqueness of this feature, you can change the color of it, and you can change the, um, the size of it, so sort of the width of it or how big it is. And what you can see here is with these additional lines of code that I have changed some properties of these features. So for example, I've changed the central tendency line here so that it is a bit thinner to the one that's um, in the sort of automatic one that you get. Um, and then with the inference bands, I've changed the opacity of these so they're a bit brighter in color. I've changed the color of the bean and its opaqueness. And lastly, with the raw data points, I've changed lots of things. I've changed the color, the opaqueness, and the size of the raw data points. So then you just get a slightly different looking figure. And so these points I'm going through with pirate plots, they are kind of more slightly visually pleasing things, but I think it's still good to be able to change your graph visually to what you, what, what you might want. And you can also change the label. So I've added a Y label that says reaction times and a main label if you would like. And lastly, you could maybe add upper and lower quartiles. So that's not automatically included within the basic pirate plot, but if you wanted, you could add these lines here that show your upper and lower quartiles. So this is basically showing the top 10% and the bottom 90% quartile with you, which you have with lines. Maybe if you wanted to show more about your data, you could do that. Um, so this is it about pirate plots. If anyone has any questions about pirate plots, now would be a good time to maybe ask them, although we can of course get back to them at the end. Uh, yes, I can see a question actually. Um, but I just want to say something first about pirate plots. Um, pirate plots are really good because they allow you to make a figure with minimal code and they're good if maybe you're new to R. I have to say that I don't actually use pirate plots a lot personally because I find it harder to personalize them um because you're a bit more limited so for for example when i was making this i couldn't work out how to change how these um how the labels of the condition and group look at the bottom like if it was up to me i'd probably prefer to have the group label at the top but i couldn't work out how to do that because you have slightly less freedom compared to if you're working gg plot but they are still very good and yes i can see people are asking questions about that i will just go back to the top questions so people don't think i am forgetting about them um, so the first question was, can hex RGB color codes be used in it and other plots too? So for definite, you can use hex and RGB color codes when you are doing anything in ggplot. So that's what uh, ggplots and brain cloud plots use ggplot. I honestly don't know about pirate plots. I expect that you will be able to. Ah, apparently, this is very helpful. Thank you, Emma. There's a good blog post on DIY pirate plots with ggplot here. So you could actually... Emma, correct me if I'm wrong, but is this a way of making something that looks like a pirate plot but instead of using the YARF um, package, you're instead creating this within the GG plot? Emma, please comment if that's true, otherwise I'm providing this information. Yes, great, thank you. Yeah, so it's layering it up manually. So if you wanted, you could do very much like we did with the jitter plot where you add the things in individually, and that will give you a lot more freedom to include additional things and change the colors so while maybe I don't use pirate plots, they are super powerful because if I was reviewing a paper, I would be very happy if I saw this. So even if someone didn't have a lot of our experience to be able to change things about and change where the labels are, they can still really well show off their data. Um, yes, and the colors function in R, if you are working in jitter plot or rank plot or any GD plot, will tell you about the colors available to you. Um, so Max said a bit higher up, is it possible to include any statistical tests in the figures? Again, yes, I am pretty certain that you can include statistical plots if you are working in rain cloud plots. So say I had my jitter plot here. Oh, I need to go to the bottom where the knife one is. 
Um, and I wanted to include a little marker showing the t-test. I could definitely do that myself in um, ggplot sort of here or any sort of ggplot. Um, with pirate plot, maybe you can, maybe I'm doing pirate plots a slight disservice. Maybe there are people who are more experienced than me using pirate plots who would be able to do these things. But I know for certain you could do these in ggplot. Uh, yeah, so does anyone else have any questions before I move on to our final plot, which is rain cloud plot? I'm just going to have a drink and turn my radiator down because it's come on and I'm going to stop. Okay. Okay. So the final plot that I'm going to talk about today is a rain cloud plot. Um, again, I'm going to be using a continuous data set. So I'm just using the same data set that I simulated above. Um, for rain cloud plot, as I kind of talked about briefly in the slides. Um, there's not a specific function in the R repository for rain cloud pots, but there is a package of functions that you can install from GitHub, which um, will help you create a rain cloud pot. And if you click this link, it will take you to the um, GitHub page where you can download it. Um, I'll just do that. Oh, where's my original one? It's a bit bad. I appear to have lost my own. It's okay, because I can just download it from my um, from the OSF page, because it's exactly the same one that is on the OSF page. Sorry, I was showing you the GitHub page, and now I appear to have lost the um, HTML markdown file I was using. That's okay, because we can just get it back. Okay, so we are back where we were. Um, so yeah, so you want to download this package from the GitHub page. I have also though provided in the OSF space um, the um, a package, well, basically an R script with um, these package functions, which you can use source to access. Okay, so like jitter plots, cloud plots are very much about assembling the layers. Um, you don't necessarily have to do these layers in the order that I've shown them in. I think it's the order that makes the most sense, but you could maybe do them in a different order if you preferred. Um, the first layer is the violin distributions. Well, this is the first layer I've gone with. And note it is specifically the GM flat violin function that, that you get from the rain cloud GitHub package. If you just use the normal GM violin function that's in ggplot, it will do a complete violin. But as I said, it's perfectly acceptable to have a half violin because by nature of what they are, uh, violins are symmetrical in nature. Um, and just like we did with the jitter plot, you want to specify in the aesthetic mappings your various X and Y variables, your fill and your color. Here we're using both fill and color for condition because G and dot, which we will add specifically relates to color, whereas the fill of your half violins um, you have to specify using the fill function. So you just have to use both. So they look like they're repeating, but they're actually referring to slightly different things. And then we're again using facet wrap to um, specify that we want to make two mini figures for the child and the adult group. You may not necessarily want to use facet wrap, by the way, if you maybe um, didn't have this many variables. If you had fewer variables, you may just want to do an X and a Y. Okay. And then it is, as I said, the GM flat violin that adds on the first part of this layer, which is the half violin. One thing to note is this position dodge. And what you can see is that all our half violins have been slightly offset to the right um, from the center line of the condition. And this is because it is in this space here that we will add in the raw data points. But that's why the violin is just slightly to the side so that they don't overlap. And you can do that using position nudge. So then the next layer is when you want to add the raw data points. And here you can see again that I've jittered the data points, this time using position jitter, um, so to stop them all from extracting each other, so that they're not all within the same vertical line. Instead, they all sort of jittered around this line. And that you, like you can kind of see, because there's loads of raw data points here, that they are slightly overlapping. But by spreading them out, you get a bit more of an idea of the distribution of these different data points. Um, one thing that's different here in this example with a rain cloud plot compared to a jitter plot is that I am now showing all the raw data. So I'm showing every single data point that I simulated or maybe you collected. 
Whereas within the, within the jitter plot, I was showing the individual participant means as dots. This is different. You could very much, if you wanted to, do a rain cloud plot where you had the individual participant means as the dots. And so it's just something to be aware of when you're thinking about how to plot your data. When you're doing a plot with a binary categorical variable, so in our case, zero or one, it is not appropriate to have um, all the rules of point sharing because they will literally just be at either zero or one. So there's no variance. That's why it makes more sense when you've got a categorical variable to plot the individual participant means. But in this case here, where you have a continuous variable, it likely makes more sense to plot all of the raw data points. Okay, so that was layer two. Layer three is when I have added the box plot. And um, again, you need to be slightly aware of here is that you need to offset the position of the box plot so that it's let central line lines up with the start of the half file limb, which is already set to be slightly to the right by the GM half file limb function. So here I'm doing this in a slightly different way. And um, I think you could do it both ways, to be honest, um, in which I just sort of say, actually, the x value, so along the x value here, I want it to be slightly offset a little bit to the right by 0.25, which is the same value that we offset the half violins by. And now you have what is a complete rain cloud plot. So you can see um, I haven't done, so I haven't turned it around. It doesn't quite look like a rain cloud plot, but if you orientate this in your head so that you have the continuous variable going on the bottom, you can see how it looks like a rain cloud plot. Um, I think there was quite a few questions about this in the slides. I haven't shown you here how to add on the mean values, but it would be fairly straightforward. You could use um, the things that I have provided. Um, I will answer that question in a second. Um, you have provided, um, sorry, the in, uh, code I have provided in the jitter plots for plotting mean values, you could use that to then add in here, say you want to add a little diamond for the mean balance. And um, the question was, why is the vertical line of the box plot not equal to the line of the violin? And um, this is because they show slightly different things. So the um, complementary, but slightly different. So the violin shows the distribution of the whole data set. So it includes both sort of an outline. So you can see an outline here, and your violin and sort of smart lights here, your violin will extend all the way up. Box plots show the, um, actually I might just go back very quickly and show my slides. And um, here, box plots, they show the interquartile ranges. So the top percentile, the, the medium, the 25th percentile, the 75th percentile, and then they also got it. Um, yes, so you get it. So um, it's showing, up to the um, certain minimum maximum limits, but it doesn't show all the outliers. You can actually, when you are working in a box plot, um, you can specify it to include the outliers, but specifically, um, so here I've said outlier shape equals zero. So you could have those additional dots included, but when you have the raw data points, I think it would be confusing to also include these additional outlier dots within your box plot. So I hope that answers your question. Okay, and finally, you can, of course, make it pretty. So here I have changed the color palette. I'm red and blue instead. And I've changed the axis labels. So they are much more informative, so experimental condition and reaction times, and also saying sort of what it is the measurement. So in this case, I've decided it's milliseconds. So I just simulated it. And again, you can change the background theme. So here I've decided that I want to make my background all white and I also don't want this dividing line between these two groups. And um, so here I've just provided the code to enable you to be able to do that as well as sort of making these uh, labels at the top black. I've also made the tick label, so the A and the B black as well as opposed to gray. And again, this is just code that you could literally just take and tack onto any plot you've made as it's not actually specific to any variables. And lastly, again, you could do this code all in one. So you could literally take, um, yeah, I think I talked about going the jitter plot. You could take all this code. Sorry to be pestering. You're not pestering at all, don't worry. Can the axes be reversed so that the violin is horizontal? Absolutely. There is a function, I think it's called like GM flip or Cartesan flip or something. 
and um, which very easily allows you to flip the axes entirely. So you don't have to even entirely remake your figure. You could just literally add on one line of code where you're like, flip. Oh, sorry that you have to leave. Thank you for coming. Um, yes, yeah, so you literally, so yes, it's very easy to do. I can't remember off the top of my head, but definitely Google it. Um, yes, so you could do this all in one. So you can have these layers all in one, but as I kind of said before, I would advise against that because it's a lot harder to spot your mistakes this way. If I was to do this and then I got an error, um, our error codes are sometimes informative, but sometimes it's hard to make sense in them. And if I was got an error, I wouldn't know where at all in this um, code I had made, made a mistake. Whereas if I imagine it layer by layer and say I just add the GM point as a layer, and so this layer here, and then I get an error, then I say, okay, well, it's a lot easier for me, to, for me to troubleshoot and to find out where exactly the error has come from. Um, you could do it all in one. Even if you're experienced, I don't really think it's a good idea always to do it all in one because, you know, we all still make mistakes. I still make my figures in layers because it's a lot easier. Okay, so I will take any questions anyone may have, but before I do, I just wanted to point out the additional resources at the bottom. So here I have all sorts of hyperlinks to different tips and online resources for pirate plots, GG plots, and brain clown plots. I also put um, quite a bit of effort into making this Armark GAN file. So if anybody's interested in the resources that I use to help me, I've also provided some links to these. And of course, you can always contact me um if you have any additional questions if you do make any beautiful figures i would love to see them they would make my day so you're very welcome to send them to me and you can find my contact details such as my email on my website you could also tweet me that would also be very nice um but yeah so i just wanted to point those out um if anybody does have to leave um i have done all the content that i'm going to cover today so if people are done but of course please do stay if you can and ask questions um, I will stay as long as people have questions. I'm quite happy to stay here for a while. But if you do have to rush off, we are now done. So, but now I will get back to some questions. So I see another question is, if the data is huge, would adding layers on top of each decrease the performance slash speed? Um, I, I don't necessarily think so. Like maybe if you're, I think your data large substantially that you would notice um when i'm making plots nine million rows and 230 columns right if you have 230 columns which all correspond to different variables you probably wouldn't want to be plotting them all on the same graph that would be my first advice because there is no way that is visually makes sense to put 230 variables all in one figure. So you want to make you multiple different variables. Half of the crap, but stakeholders, yes. You would want to choose the variables that are relevant um, and which would make sense to your stakeholders. Um, nine million rows, I have to admit that I've never dealt with a data set that large. Um, I've run really complex models in R and it always gets there eventually. And one thing I would suggest is if when you are maybe trying out, uh, thank you, Beth, thank you. Um, if or maybe you are trying out different visualizations, don't be working with the entire data set the first time you try it. Maybe take a hundred rows of your data and work out how to make a plot with that. And then once you've worked that out, you can do it with your nine million rows and maybe it'll be a bit slower, but you wouldn't have wasted time uh, because when you were sort of working out how to do it, you just want a data set. Okay, um, yes, thank you to everybody saying that you enjoyed it. Um, there's a few more questions coming through. There was just, Emma, I'll get to your question in a minute. There's just one question. Yeah, there was just a question by Max a bit higher, just so you don't miss it if you go up the conversation. Oh, yes, sorry. <laughs> Max, I didn't see that one at all. Having used GD Pot in the last so I can add a layer to load a set. Um, I've never personally added a layer to show a stat. I have sort of taken the statistical um, values, so maybe it was T values or P values, and I've added them maybe as text as an additional layer. 
So yes, in that sense, you can maybe like if you just output, if you do the mix or you have a table, you can't directly just take that output and add it to your layer. You may want to do a little bit of wrangling first to put it in, to extract the variables that you want to specifically add to your plot. But in principle, yes, you can add statistical information to plots. Um, okay, and then I saw somebody had a question below Beth. Do you use single core or multiple? I'm sorry, I don't know what you're referring to. Single core. Sorry. So, uh, Sophie, by default, R and Python use the single core of. Uh, but you can do a parallel processing uh, in order to. Oh, know, sorry, sorry. A... Yeah, I do know what you're referring to. Sorry, I was thinking too much about figures. Um, <laughs> I primarily always use single core, not had a problem. Um, I can't speak too much about that, but that is what I'm using in response to your question. Okay, Emma's question I think was next. Marion, please tell me if I've missed any out. Um, thank you, Emma. So you say, do you suggest any recommendations as suggest for count type data? I love the idea of plotting more data, but often struggle as I only have a limited range of possible values i.e. Child, children must, only, children might only run three as we should know. So I don't know your data set fully, Emma, but in that case, could you still not use something like a jitter plot? Because the reason why I really want to talk about jitter plots is because I work quite a bit with categorical data. And in my example, it's either did they produce a certain sentence type or a different sentence types. Um, and I struggle for a long time to find an appropriate way to visualize it. Um, and then I sort of came across jitter plots. I guess, in a way, they do not have, I don't know, because I don't know your data. Maybe there is some way, starting from the point of a jitter plot, that you could use to use count data. So you can have individual data points for each participant's count, and then you have a mean bar height showing the mean count. Um, but you're right, it is a lot harder to visualize count or discrete data compared to something that is continuous. But I think if you're showing off the individual participant values or means, whatever they will be and whatever is most appropriate, then you are making a good effort towards good data visualization. I hope that answers it, Emma. I'm not sure that was the most clear one, but thank you. Oh, it does. I might, I might. I'm inspired to try again a bit harder, just often when I do try, because there's not enough variability, I just end up with these huge clumps. But um, yeah, perhaps I should revisit. <laughs> maybe, maybe. <laughs> well, I hope it is useful. It is. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, um, and then there's some very nice people saying thank you. That is very nice. Uh, Yes, data table can be helpful if you're working with large data sets and you want to summarize it. Um, people are saying thank you, thank you very much. Someone has said extremely useful presentation. Okay, this person is also just saying thank you as well. <laughs> um, yeah, so well, thank you all very much. I do hope you all enjoyed um listening to me talk. This is something that I am quite uh, enthusiastic about. Um, I think digitalization is really important. One thing I do think I'm going to think about more is what Beth said at the beginning, which is how to, to visualize your data in a way that I feel does the data set full justice, but while also making it appropriate for specialist audiences. And that's something I think is definitely important to bear in mind. But I hope you have um, by doing, I talking on today and showing you these different code. As we said, the code is available online. Um, but yeah, so I will take any more questions. But if not, thank you all ever so much for coming. Marion has again posted the code. We will also email about it. Marion, would you like to post the um, email sign up again? Yep. Yeah, because if you're not already on our mailing list, we will send out the video link uh, via email and also um, on Twitter. Um, I think I did answer Max's question because Max said thank you, but I've forgotten what Max's question was. So if you have another follow up question, you can ask that. From that extensive survey.
I'm sorry, I've entirely forgotten, but I hope. I think that's a joke referring to the survey for the mailing list. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's just one. Sorry, no sorry. I'm just, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, so I guess if there are no other questions, we'll stop here. Maybe I will stop the recording for sure.